Hello. Hello. Yeah. How are you? Good. How are you? Very good. Thank you. So, uh, you know, now it's uh, 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. uh, I haven't attended, um, I haven't been able to attend any of the previous talks, but I was told that there's like a 15 minutes of talking and then some five to 10 minutes of a break. Is that correct? So 10 minutes coffee break. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. where people can ask uh, questions, make comments. Good. Yeah. Of course, they can also interrupt during the talk. Of course. <laughs> thank uh, you so much for inviting me. Well, thank you for, for giving us this talk. Uh, can you uh, share the screen? Let's see. Um, yes. Should I share? Yes, yes. Uh, let's uh, okay. try it. Do you see this? Yes, perfect. Yeah. Okay, great. Is that a painting or a simulation? <laughs> I wish it was a simulation. I would be very proud of myself if I did that. <laughs> but no, it's just a painting. <laughs> Given that it's a short talk, I took my freedom to make the slides no, very, colorful. Very nice. <laughs> yeah. Okay, we will wait. Uh, well, it's still early. We will wait uh, a few minutes more and then start. All right. <clears throat> Thank you. 
Well, maybe we can uh, start. Uh, people will join along the seminar. Mm -hmm. uh, so today uh, we have another internal seminar. It's uh, a great pleasure to have uh, Maria Tomasevich, and he will tell us uh, uh, some ex about uh, this exciting uh, topic, uh, aspects of transversible wormholes. So please uh, start. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you very much for inviting me. Um, it's a pleasure to finally give a talk after four years of PhD. So yeah, as you mentioned, I'm going to be talking about traversable wormholes and some aspects of them. So the outline of the talk is as follows. I will cover three topics, so to say, you know, history, physics, and applications of these wormholes. And to be more concrete, when I say history, I mean, we're going to see what is the timeline of wormhole constructions from the first construction we ever found to the modern day constructions that we have. Then I will describe what kind of physics is necessary in order to make a wormhole traversable. And then in the end, I will just mention some possible applications of these wormholes, not just for gravitational physics, but also in more of a quantum regime. Okay, so let me start then with the wormhole timeline. As all good things GR, we start in 1960 when Ludwig Flamm finds the first solution. Um, of course, back then they weren't known as wormholes. Uh, I don't know how Ludwig Flamm was actually referring to them, but we know that Weil gave them a name of one dimensional tubes, which didn't sound very exciting, but nevertheless, there were solutions that were found. Uh, some years later, we get to the same solution, but now by some more famous people, let's say like that. Einstein and Rosenbridge um, is actually the same solution that Flam found. Of course, now it's known as just the ER bridge. And a couple of decades after that, we come to the modern day uh, term that we have for wormholes or just wormhole. Well, Wheeler in 1957 coined the term. 
Shortly after that, we have first constructions of traversable wormholes. These were done independently by Ellis and Bronikov. And now you see here that it says that it's exotic traversable wormholes. And that just means that they use some physics um, that wasn't known, or so to say, matter that wasn't known at the time, and nor is known today, really. They just needed this exotic type of matter in order to fulfill certain energy conditions, as we will see later on. And with uh, the general theme of these wormholes is that there was another group of people who did the same job. They just were more famous, and so they got the credit. Morris and Thorne, which accomplished the same thing as Ellis and Bronikov. Now, jumping a little bit ahead, uh, we get to 2010 and 2007, where Wall used the generalized second law in order to rule out short wormholes um, in general relativity. We'll see why that is the case. But a little bit before he did so, Graham and Allen used um, what, well, they established something called the achronal average null energy condition and used the same condition in order to rule out short wormholes. Um, okay. Finally, we get to modern day constructions. The first constructions were done within the context of ADS-CFT. So ADS-CFT, just to remind you, is this duality be between gravitational theories and quantum field theories. And so within that context, we had Gao Jeffress and Wall who made the first construction of a short lived wormhole. And it was followed up by Maldesen and his collaborators where they extended the lifetime of a wormhole. Um, so that was in the context of ADS-CFT. And a couple of years later, we have constructions outside of the regime of ADS-CFT where we had uh, perturbative constructions of wormholes by Greta White and all, and then also non-perturbative constructions by Maldesena and his group. And later on, I will cover this example in a little bit more detail. But for now, I would like to talk about the basics of wormhole physics. And of course, we have to start with what is a wormhole and why is it allowed even? Well, one thing that we need to know is that general relativity in general allows any smooth manifold, Lorentzian manifold, to be a spacetime. Simply, we're given a spacetime geometry, and one solves the Einstein's equations in order to determine what kind of energy source is needed to produce it. Um, but not all of these spacetimes are going to be physical spacetimes. And we restrict the set of physical spacetimes by using these energy conditions that we employ on the stress tensor. So, Non-trivial phenomena such as wormholes or time machines, for example, are going to have restrictions that are given in terms of these energy conditions. So let's see what are these energy conditions and how do they restrict it? Well, there are generally two groups of energy conditions that we're going to see. The first group is for the classical physics, where it's known nowadays that um, all classical matter needs to obey something called a null energy condition. Mathematically, this is written in this way. It's just a statement that the stress tensor contracted with two null vectors has to be positive, or in more layman terms, energy must be positive at every point. And um, this is something that is going to be the weakest condition for all classical matter. One thing that we can do with this energy condition is then derive from it, so to say, that matter, classical matter, uh, will make light rays converge. This is just a restatement of the fact that matter has gravitational field around it, gravitational field is attractive. And just like, for example, black holes make light um, bend when it goes near it, we see that all matter is going to make the matter, uh, sorry, the light rays converge to each other. So classical matter, light rays converging. So this is for classical physics. However, we have the other regime, which is the quantum physics. And for quantum physics, we have something called the uh, achronal average null energy condition. The mathematical statement is very similar. It's more or less the same as the null energy condition, just integrated over some um, geodesic gamma. This is a null geodesic of a particular kind. And what this achronal average null energy condition says is that energy has to be positive on average along this particular 
achronal null ray. And a synonym for achronal is a fastest null ray. So let's see a little bit more closely what this ANEC, uh, in short, tells us. So let's figure out what the two A's stand for in another way, uh, in other words. So the achronal or fastest just means that our um, null ray cannot have any points along it that can be connected by a time-like path. Or in other words, there cannot be any time-like shortcut um, along this null ray. The null ray has to be the fastest possible way for you to get from point A to point, to point B. The second A stands for average. And this is a necessary condition because it is known that quantum fluctuations can lead to locally negative energies. And so if we wanna make a statement about positivity of some energy, we have to average over um, the said null energy condition. And finally, if you remember, we uh, explained that positive energy is going to cause focusing of light rays and positive energy is something that classical matter obeys. So negative energy must defocus them. And this is important for our discussion of wormholes. So let's see how this is important. So these energy conditions are going to help us see what kind of wormholes are allowed and what kind of physics. And it turns out that in classical physics, the only types of wormholes we can have are the non-traversable ones. And so why is that the case? Well, light rays focus when entering one of the wormhole mouths, just like I mentioned happens for a black hole. However, they are going to converge within to get inside the wormhole, but in order to exit the wormhole, they need to defocus. And so, as we explained before, in order to have this defocusing, we're going to need some negative energy for that, and classical physics doesn't allow negative energies. But that's why we can, allow, we can have traversable wormholes in quantum physics. Quantum physics allows for these negative energies to exist. However, you can see here that we have a little asterisk. So this is supposed to indicate that there is a slight caveat that these wormholes, even though they're traversable, they have to be longer than the ambient space distance between the wormhole mounts. So in the outside space time, so to say. So it's not very good for science fiction. You are always going to take longer traveling through the wormhole than in actual space time. But in any case, we do have traversable wormholes. OK, so we have these wormholes. Can we see some examples of them? Well, I'm going to now just uh, cite a couple of modern constructions that I mentioned in the uh, wormhole timeline and see what they actually refer to. So we start with the first one, of course, by Gao, Jeffress, and Wall, who in 2016 managed to construct short-lived traversable wormholes within the context of ADS-EFT. Maldacena and Chi, a couple of years later, managed to improve on that model by making a long-lived traversable wormhole. Uh, but just a couple of months later, we have Fu, Greta White, and Merov making a perturbative construction of wormholes outside of the regime of ADS-CFT, and they use something called the cosmic strings in order to um, provide for this negative energy that is necessary for supporting the wormhole. Turns out that in the same month, Maldasena, Milekin, and Popov managed to construct in a non-perturbative fashion, so to say, a traversable wormhole, not using any cosmic strings, but solely using magnetic fields. And it turns out just a matter within the standard model. So this was really great. And that's why I'm going to cover this uh, paper in a little bit more detail later on. But I just wanted to mention now that there has been a paper last year by Maldesena and Milekin, where they managed to improve on their model by actually making these traversable wormholes humanly traversable which means that humans can traverse it. They didn't stick within the standard model, but just slightly expanded upon it and used something called the Randall syndrome brains, um, which were, for those of you who remember or know about this, in the 90s were one way of modeling what our world might be like. Um, we would live on a brain and it would be embedded in a higher dimensional space time. So they were using these models and they were using experimental bounds actually 
to uh, to see that humans could traverse in in uh, our universe if it if it can be described by Randall syndrome rate that is. Okay, so before I move on to the actual explanation of the of the Sena Milekin Popov, are there any questions so far? Uh, well, I have a uh, one question. Yeah. <clears throat> To have a, well, quantum fluctuations uh, allow you typically for a small violation of, uh, of uh, the energy conditions through this uh, NEC hypothesis, uh, right? Uh, but to have a big effect, uh, as far as I remember, Maldacena has to introduce a, a large number of degrees of freedom in this, uh, in, That's in the theory, no? Uh, so my question is, uh, so you have a, something that uh, produces large quantum fluctuations, in presumably only near the mouth of the wormhole, right? Because otherwise it will defy the full physics around, no? Well, actually, this is one of the reasons why the wormhole length has to be long. Um, I, I can explain this if you want. OK. So, so as you mentioned, quantum fluctuations are going to induce negative energies. And in general, we can have negative energies that can violate the average null energy condition. And this is why the, uh, the condition of acronality was important. Basically, acronality told us that no null geodesic, uh, sorry, so achronal means that a null geodesic cannot be such that has a time-like shortcut. And so, for example, if I was to have a short wormhole, then the null geodesic that traverses through the wormhole is actually going to be shortcutted by um, by uh, by a time-like path, so to say. I, I don't so remember I in this last in this last paper by Maldacena on humanly tra transversable wormholes. It is also the case that going through the wormholes, you spend more time than going directly over the space time? Yes, that's true, yeah. OK. Yeah, mm -hmm. so, so there is no, uh, you are not violating any energy conditions simply because for a long wormhole, you cannot apply the achronal average knowledge and condition. So that's why you needed the, the, the actual condition that it has to be long. So that you cannot apply the achronal average knowledge condition, and so you can have negative energy inside mm -hmm. in order to support the one pole. Um, okay. So that is the way. I, I, I'm not sure that I answered the question, but. Yes, well, my main worry was about uh, you have to put in uh, some quantum system localized somehow in the one hole mouse or in the black hole mouse in order to violate to have a strong effect. Otherwise, if you, will, you will only create a microscopic wormholes and you are interested in macroscopic ones, right? And my worry is that uh, why these huge uh, quantum fluctuations don't affect uh, the, 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 the classical physics, no? And presumably it's because they are important only in the, in the mouth, no? Uh, okay. Uh, Sina, I think he puts a conformal field C or, well, I don't remember what he puts exactly. Right. So only localized, no? It's localized in the sense that the fermions which provide the negative energy are localized to move only along the magnetic field lines, which are closed and traverse through the wormhole. Right. That right. I'm going to so mention afterwards. They yeah. cannot affect the out external world uh, physics somehow, no? Uh, no, they shouldn't. They shouldn't affect anything. Yeah, well, that that was yeah. mainly my question. Yeah. Okay, okay. Thank yeah. you. Yes. Other questions? I can make a comment. Um, when you say that a classical matter always satisfies the null the condition. Uh, for scalar fields, you are assuming that they, these are minimally coupled, because if they are not minimally coupled, even at the classical level, you can violate the null energy condition and you can actually construct 100% classical, no quantum effect, traversal wall holes with no minimally coupled scalars. I, I think that is correct, yeah. Yes, so I was then referring only to the minimally coupled cases. Okay. Um, 
Okay, but, but so for the non-experts, you know, what, what can what is minimally coupled? Uh, so the, if it's non-minimally coupled, then does it mean there is some negative potential energy that's very, very big, or what does it mean? Uh, Maria, you want to answer that? Or um, is that... Yeah, I'm not sure that I will be able to give a good answer. Mm -hmm. uh, when you have a, a scalar field, you can uh, write a coupling to the Ricci uh, scalar of, of the curve of the space time. Okay, so something like uh, some dimensionless number, chi times uh, the Ricci scalar times phi squared. Okay, and you have a choice if you are going to put this coupling to zero, to zero or not. And only for she equals zero, what Maria was saying is actually correct. But you can entertain the idea that she is different from zero. And in fact, for a conformal field theory, is different from zero. So even at the classical level, if you allow for this coupling, you can have a traversable one hole that don't use any quantum physics. I see. Okay, but so so far, what we know in the standard model, there is coupling is only among the fields, but the gravity interaction of the fields is just through what general relativity predicts, right? Through this cur curved space. Then we we don't have any such term r times phi squared you were talking about. Actually, we don't know if the Higgs field, or actually, I don't know. And people, uh, I think this is an open question. What is if uh, the Higgs field is coupled to the a scalar of the space time to the rich scalar, is there a non-zero coupling or not? The question is, how do you measure that experiment? Okay, okay. But, this, uh, this would be a violation of the equivalence principle, right? If there um, is an R phi squared term with some field. The, actually, I don't know about that. No, I don't think so, but uh, it would violate the... Uh, uh, sorry, if you have such term, uh, uh, it would have violate some of the energy conditions, no? It does violate the null energy conditions. Yeah, but we know experimentally that it's not uh, that uh, you don't have anti gravity in the universe, no? You don't have anti gravity. Uh, yeah, so that's. Uh, I, I think that there's uh, that? An, yeah. the, there's another problem with this that this uh, in this case I think that you have instabilities, right? Oh, well, if these solutions are unstable, I, I, I'm not only... No, 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 I mean that the sign of the of the coupling of the minimal scalar, mm -hmm. uh, that uh, doesn't uh, give, tend to give you... I mean, that's, uh, I mean, the, what, what you're having is something that can give uh, something like a negative mass, right? Mm -hmm. Well... I think that... Uh, I, I don't think so. I think it's, it's the. I, I'm always thinking about she positive. She negative is is pathological, probably. Okay, so you're not. Yeah. But then, so I mean, you're talking about the coupling R phi squared, right? Yes. So then, R depending R on what the sign of R is, you can get uh, instability. Well, well, well if you, the I energy is uh, negative, uh, that's uh, that's a sign of instability, no? Uh, yes. Uh, but anyway, I think that this is because, yeah, the, the, there's other ways of classically with uh, things that, uh, well, you sneak in something that uh, is uh, in some way pathological, like and you can also add uh, higher curvature terms and higher curvature terms can give you such effects, but they also bring with them other uh, pathologies. I, I think, well, uh, th this case that you're talking about of uh, non-minimal coupling, uh, yeah, I'm not completely paper, sure. That. Yeah, Tomel, this is a paper that the, that came out not too long ago, is that correct? No, Barcelona Bissard is from the 90s, I think. Yeah. But uh, I mean, I don't want to hijack this, but N equals to- I mean, for the, the, where they actually used the, for the creation of a traversable wormhole, I meant. Yeah, they, the they, negative energies. they use, uh, and any conformal like theory like with, with the scalars uh, is going to, to give you examples of this. N equals to four super jam mills or any supersymmetric theory with uh, uh, scalars, uh, they are conformally coupled, so they are not minimal, and they allow for, at the classical level, traversable workholes. But, uh, Tomeu, uh, the hypothesis is that uh, you have classical matter that satisfies the null energy condition. It's the only hypothesis you need to rule out the uh, topologically non-trivial uh, 
I'm I'm hundred percent happy with that. My only point was that you don't need say, to look at the microscopic theory. You just make this hypothesis. I I'm not arguing with that. I'm only saying that when we say classical matter, if we rule out from the start uh, non minimally coupled scalars, fine, but uh, I think it's, it's worth keeping in mind that N equals four super jam mills has uh, non minimally coupled scalars. But, uh, but if you have uh, that such kind of matter, that's my point in, in, real, mm -hmm. in, real, in real physics, uh, it will uh, lead to other catastrophic effects that we don't see. As I said, it's anti-gravity. No? Not sure about that. Well, <clears throat> well, if you have such scalar fields uh, with negative energy, well, okay, let's say, <laughs> perhaps let's continue. Yeah, sorry. I have to say that I haven't thought about non-minimally coupled scalars in this context. Um, but it's a good point. Um, maybe I'll have to look at that after the talk. Maybe continue, Maria. Okay. Talk. Okay. Um, okay. So I am going to now continue talking about this one specific example, actually the one that you mentioned by Maldasen and Roikian Bulo. So this is an example of a traversable wormhole in four dimensions. Um, so the paper is given here. And so let me remind you now, the key features that such a wormhole has to have is a long throw and supporting negative energy. Um, and so these guys had to figure out how to actually make these key features work out. So for the long throat, there exists something called a near extremal rise and rise from black hole which in layman terms just means that it's a black hole with some specific charge and it's a magnetic charge. And the specific kind of black holes have long throats. They are known and the, the fact that something is near extremal actually implies that these black holes are gonna have long throat. And the near extremal just means that the mass of these black holes is more or less the same as the charge of the black holes. And now for the supporting negative energy, well, we saw a couple of examples, I guess, but the one that is more used is, a Casim is the Casimir effect. But as mentioned before, it's a tiny quantum effect. So if we don't want to have very tiny black wormholes, we would want to have some, for example, humanly traversable wormholes. We need to, in some way, amplify this effect so as to make the mouse bigger. And so they managed to do, do just this. Um, and so I'm just going to go through the construction in some steps. So we have magnetic, magnetic traversable wormholes. Um, and so what we do, we start with two near extremal rising and some black holes and we connect their throats. So an artist's impression is something like this. Of course, we cannot connect them just in any way. We have to connect them in such a way so as for the throat to be longer than the distance between the mouse and ambient space. So this is the longer throat condition. And now, given that these black holes are magnetically charged, we have some magnetic field lines. And most of them are going to go out of the mouse, but some of them are going to connect up and make a magnetic loop that traverses through the wormhole. Now, we can put fermions on this magnetic field line. And it is known that, magnet that fermions on a loop, or in, to be more specific in ADS2, they, uh, they give negative Casimir energy. And so if we just manage to put a lot of them, then we get a traversable wormhole. So that's it. That's the basic idea that Maldesen and Milikin and Popo had behind their construction. So let's see what are some of the properties of these wormholes. So as I mentioned before, they're in four dimensions, but they are also embedded in asymptotically flat space time. Although this is not a nature, they can be embedded in the sitter or anti the sitter just as easily. Then the physics used is entirely contained within the standard model. And even though this is nice from a um, phenomenological point of view, so to say, this does put a restriction on the size of these wormholes. And so they turn out to be very small. Small only um, so much that only low energy particles can actually traverse it. 
Of course, we can make them bigger if we deviate away from the standard model, in which case we have the case of the humanly traversable wormholes that I discussed previously. And now just to give you an idea of just how small these wormholes are, the size of the system is smaller than the electroweak scale. And the basic intuition behind this is that the fermions that we put in that are giving us the negative energy are effectively massless. And we would like to keep them like that because if they were to have some positive mass, it would overcome the effect of the negative energy that they're producing. And so it would collapse the wormhole. So we need to keep the system smaller than the electroweak scale. Not only that, these wormholes are also very fragile. It turns out that so we saw that we cannot make the wormhole as short as we want, but we cannot make it even long as, as long as we want to, because it turns out that quantum fluctuations can destroy the wormhole if it becomes too long. Nevertheless, they can be made to be long lived. Um, so if we just put them next to each other, of course, they're gravitationally attracting and they're going to coalesce into each other. But as with most astrophysical objects, we can put them into a binary orbit. And so they are going to rotate around each other and radiate some electromagnetic and gravitational waves, eventually leading to a collision. But this can be made arbitrarily far into the future from this theoretical standpoint. OK, so these were the properties of the magnetic traversable wormholes. Uh, excuse me, so could I, could I ask something that uh, wasn't clear to me here? So First, uh, here you talked about magnetically charged uh, wormholes, but does this mean you're assuming there are magnetic monopoles? That's a good question. Um, so these wormholes are expected to be created in a pair uh, creation type of creation, so to say. So it's always going to look like a dipole um, if it's a wormhole actually. However, if you manage to break apart the wormhole, then yes, they would look like magnetic monopoles. Um, but this, we, we think this doesn't exist. I mean, this doesn't exist in the standard model. So then how could... So this would be something that would go beyond the standard model. I agree. Yeah. Although I don't know how, what the actual expectations are if one includes the, effect of, the effects of quantum gravity. One no, might expect to actually... I, I don't think that they would go beyond the standard model. If by standard model we mean Einstein-Maxwell, in Einstein-Maxwell theory, uh, that's uh, yeah. I mean, you can have uh, magnetically magnetically charged uh, black holes, which in principle you can create uh, in principle uh, by per production, and this is what uh, I mean. You don't need uh, magnetic monopoles, which are not uh, black holes. You don't need them in the, in the theory. So just Einstein-Maxwell theory can give you what... Uh, All right, sorry, maybe I wasn't clear, yeah. I mean, I mentioned that you always have to pair produce them. So it's not something like, oh, I can just start with the magnetic monopole, I don't know, bring it to another one. And if I have a lot of them, I have a black hole. It's a very specific type of... Um, I was just trying to make the point that when you make these wormholes, you always make them in, in a fashion of pair creation. So yeah, you never okay. make a magnetic monopole, actually. OK, and uh, the other thing is that when you talk about these black holes with a charge, uh, rise, uh, sorry, rise, forget and that. Nordstrom? Yeah. rise and Nordstrom, I mean, we know that in real life, uh, these black holes with a large charge, they will just emit positrons or electrons until the charge goes away, right? Um, so you cannot have them in real life. <laughs> I'm assuming then one can do some things like, uh, so now this is more speculative, so I'm but not really sure. I, um, I think that, yeah, let, let me say, because the answer you just gave it, if there are no magnetic monopoles, uh, then these yeah. uh, black holes will, will not discharge. By yeah, any, I was going to charges. say actually, okay. um, yeah. <laughs> so you can have basically near, near, uh, near critical Rise, rise and Nordstrom bar black holes with magnetic charge, that they will not decay their charge. Yeah. Yeah, okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah that's a good way to put it. So, Maria, yes? if they are so small, uh, how are they humanly tra traversable? Uh, they are not. The, the one that I described now is a paper from 2018. Ah, okay, okay. This here paper from last year actually made it 
um, made an upgrade and made them actually humanly traversable. So are they bigger? Yeah, the ones from 2020 are bigger. <laughs> and how can you make them big? Uh, well, I thought you already explained that. These are the specifics of the model that they used. Um, so let me try to remember how they did it. So, so the point is that you have some five dimensional bulk and you put a four dimensional brain in this bulk. And so using, so to say, ADS-CFT or just simply reducing the physics, if you will, the bulk physics from five dimensions induces some CFT physics on the four dimensional brain, right? And the CFT can then be used instead of these fermions in order to be the massless generator of the negative energy. And so in that sense, you're not going to have the restriction that the fermions have with the electroweak scale and the Higgs. Um, and so they can be made bigger. I, I would say that this is like the essence of what, uh, what is the main difference between this model and that model. I don't know, Roberto, if you want to comment something else. Well, maybe what I can add is that I mean, you have this uh, extra bulk direction, which as Maria was explaining, that's something that we can understand as some uh, conformal field theory in our world. This conformal field theory, is a, this is a kind of a dark sector that interacts uh, with the rest of the world only gravitationally. So then you can have a large uh, number of these conformal fields, uh, which produce some observational effects, but they, they can be... Uh, they can be bounded. You can, I mean, even if we have a, a huge number of uh, conformal fields around us, they are only interacting gravitationally. And since gravity is weak, they don't uh, almost affect the rest of the world. You can find what are the bounds on the on the number of these uh, additional conformal fields, which is a bound on the size of the additional directions. And what uh, what what you can see is that uh, it's observationally consistent to have a huge number of these, well, such a large number of these conformal fields that the, their effect on gravitational effect on the wormhole can uh, allow uh, people to go through the through the wormhole, through the wormhole. Okay. I don't know if that's answering what you were asking. Comment. Yeah. Uh, maybe uh, what happens also is that uh, you have these uh, fermions, no? which live in closed magnetic lines. So when you have a fermion on the circle, uh, you have a Casimir energy, which is negative. Mm -hmm. And uh, so this is the way you produce the, the negative energy, which is necessary to have a topological non-trivial space according to the theory, energy theory, right? Exactly. In addition, now you are free to put a, an arbitrary number of fermions. So if you put a large number of fermions, then that effect is multiplied by the number of fermions. And in that way, you can have a, a large wormhole. Is that uh, correct? Well, in the model that they used, there is only so much that they can put. Um, um, so they do put a large number of fermions, but this large number of fermions can make the wormhole only so big. It cannot make it actually big enough for humans. Um, mm -hmm. This has to do with the interplay between the parameters of the wormhole because everything is very intertwined. The charge that you're using, the fact that these fermions have to be massless, the number of them. Um, so it turns out that you cannot make it as big as to fit in a human, which would be much more massive than, for example, an electron. Mm -hmm. um, Great. I think if you just use standard model fermions, the number of fermionic degrees of freedom, if you count them all and uh, count them uh, gener generously, you can get uh, up to 50 or so. 50 no, no, is not such a large number. You mentioned dark sector, no? Yeah, if you have the dark sector, then that, that dark sector, it's conformal fields, not necessarily fermions. And in that case, they can be they can be very large. They can be right. 10 to the, to the many, I don't remember the... So, so my answer was in the context of this 2018 paper, but this paper from last year actually can put a lot more fermions because they're not constrained by the normal. Okay, thanks. Maria, Yeah. can I ask you something? Of course. Um, so how common are, like given a model, how common are these wormhole solutions? Or are they like really fine tuned things that you have to build? 
or should I expect them to exist like more generally as I expect, for example, general relativity to have black holes? Good question. Um, I would say that these wormholes are not at all so common, at least not as common as black holes. If, if you compare them in an ensemble, for example, you will see that black holes always dominate. Um, but nevertheless, it's a solution that at least is plausible within the physics that we now know. So not even going you know, beyond into quantum gravity of some sort. Everything that you need is just the standard model and gravity. So in principle, it's something that you can imagine constructing in a lab. Um, but I would say you would have a tough choice. Uh, well, a tough time finding them in the sky. OK, thanks. Any other questions? All right. Well, covering these properties on these traversable wormholes was nice. But um, one question that I guess remains is what can we use these wormholes for? What can we do with them? So I made a slide called Why Are Wormholes Interesting? Where basically I just put my own opinion for why I find these wormholes to be interesting and what uses we can uh, have from them. And so the first thing that I would like to note is that wormholes are the simplest example of non-trivial topology, which is something that we can consistently explore. So given a wormhole that is traversable, we can probe it, we can send stuff through it, we can measure observables, we can calculate a lot of things. So it's a very first example of non-trivial topology that we know how to explore. And it's not something that we knew from the beginning. As you saw, like um, the first solution was found in 1916, but it's only a hundred years later in 2016 that we actually learned how to make a consistent solution of a traversable wormhole. And so one question that one can ask if wormholes are possible, then what else can we construct? Something that we cannot even imagine right now. So that would be kind of like an ambitious question um, to answer. But more down to earth, so to say, is if we go to the regime of ADS-CFT, in which we have seen that these wormholes have played a very crucial role in several different aspects. Um, and by wormholes, I mean both traversable and non-traversable. And I'm just gonna mention a couple of things. So for the non-traversable wormholes, they have shown us, or at least they have paved the way for understanding how the geometry emerges from entanglement. This is a whole new um, field uh, and an aspect of physics called ER equals EPR, in which we have ER standing for Einstein-Rosen and EPR standing for Einstein-Podolsky-Rosen. And even though they sound similar, the Einstein-Rosen, as you now know, stands for non-traversable wormholes, and EPR stands for bell pairs, so literally quantum state, which is an entangled state. And so we have managed through the years to somehow use these wormholes in order to understand better the relationship between geometry and entanglement. And these wormholes are, in a sense, analogous to what entanglement is in quantum physics at least the non-traversable ones. Uh, for example, you can already see that just by having entanglement, you cannot send information through entanglement. You would need some classical communications or just the uh, interaction between the two sides. From the wormhole perspective, we see the same thing. If we have a non-traversable wormhole, we cannot send information through the wormhole. But as we have seen now, we can make these wormholes traversable. And so what this means for the quantum part is that we have quantum teleportation. And this is something that is now being explored. It's quantum teleportation in many body systems. And so these wormholes might be a result of a very uh, large number of particles, which then result in actual traversable wormhole, but that just started as a couple of qubits uh, interacting um, and being entangled. So this is very new and this is still being explored, but it emphasizes the role that these wormholes have played in ADS-CFT. And of course, there are many other aspects of this that I haven't mentioned. These are just the main two ideas that one can think about. 
But of course, if you don't want to think about ADS-EFT, you want to think about, let's say, the, the real world, there are plenty of questions to be answered, given that we now have a whole new subfield of wormhole physics. Um, for example, can we now explore black hole interiors now that we know how to manipulate wormholes? Can we try to make time machines out of these wormholes? For example, uh, in the same way that people in the 90s have tried to do out of their wormholes. Can we actually build a traversable wormhole? Which is the thing that I said before, that this is maybe something that you can dream about building in a lab. Uh, is this something that you can detect one day? Maybe not, maybe yes, but maybe there was a time when they would actually dominate over black holes. This is also something that we don't know yet. Are there multi-mouse generalizations? Since I have only been talking about the two mouse wormholes, but how just, yeah, just two uh, mouse. And from all of these questions, and there are many more, I just listed a couple of them, I can at least answer one of them. And this is the multi-mouse generalization one, and it's an affirmative answer. Um, and actually we explored this in a paper not too long ago. So I'm just gonna give you the basic idea of what we did. So these are the multi-holes um, by with Roberto, Brianna, Don uh, in December. And so the basic idea is just that we um, use the magnetic traversable wormhole of Malocena, Milekin, and Popo, and simply inserted the small black hole at the bottom of the throat of this big wormhole. And so the picture is something like this, where this big tube is supposed to represent the magnetic traversable wormhole, and the small, small tube is supposed to be the, the small black hole insertion. Um, and so one reason, for example, why this would be useful or interesting to even talk about is because one can then study the multipartite nature of entanglement from the dual theory, which is something that hasn't been explored in full detail before. What we know from previous work is that they um, managed to deal with non-traversable wormholes, and they saw that they, uh, they can determine the entanglement structure of these wormholes by looking at positions of certain surfaces. It's a, it's a scheme that doesn't matter now, but they found a way to, to actually um, pin down what the entanglement structure just by looking at some surfaces, which is pretty simple. However, as I mentioned, these wormholes were non-traversable and now we can actually improve on this. So this is something that we might um, do in the future. Okay, so with that, I'm just gonna give a brief summary. So we've seen that traversable wormholes are alive and well one simply needs to make them long enough and add negative energy to support them. We've also seen that we have various examples today of these traversable wormhole constructions from ads cft but also from those using standard model only. And finally, studying these exact constructions of wormholes is not only useful in the context of gravitational physics, but is also useful for studying entanglement structures and, structures and uh, studying the holographic dictionary. And as we have seen, there still remain many questions to be answered. So thank you. Well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, questions? Well, I have one uh, to start with. Um, what is known about the stability uh, of these uh, configurations, especially in the multi-mouse uh, case? Mm -hmm. um, okay, so that's a good question. So for example, it's, it's very tricky to just put a black hole. What can do it and what can make it stable, but um, in order to balance out the gravitational and the electromagnetic forces, it's much easier to work with the construction that was put forth by Merrill et al, where they use cosmic strings. And so the basic mechanism because co behind cosmic strings is basically that they, uh, they attach to the black hole, they go off to infinity, or they can traverse through the wormhole giving negative energy, but they act literally as strings that make things stable. <laughs> and so given enough cosmic strings, we can make any of these uh, insertions of black holes stable just by uh, putting more and more of these cosmic strings. So in that sense, it can be very stable. Um, 
but but you can try and play with the parameters that you were given with the standard model and all. Um, and you can see if you can make it and make it stable in that way. Uh, one way that would also be more stable is to actually go a little bit beyond standard model and include different charges for different mounts. So as for the fermions that go around, not to interact with the fermions that go around the other two mounts. Uh, so that will be one way to actually make the thing stable. But there are still issues regarding stability that are on a more non perturbative level. And this is something that also exists in the Maldus and Amelia King Popov paper as well. And this is the create, pair creation of monopoles actually in the wormhole mouth that can actually stabilize. Um, but these are issues that can be suppressed by the number of fermions or just the charge of the black holes. So they can make, they can be sufficiently stable, so to say. Uh, my second question was regarding one of your questions in the previous mm -hmm. slide. Uh, can we detect them? If you have, say, a very powerful telescope and you can point to the mouth of a wormhole, what would be a signature that you would say this is a wormhole? <laughs> um, that's a very good question. It's one of those that I don't know how to answer. <laughs> because it looks like a black hole, like a black hole, no, from the outside. That's, uh, so yeah, if you just look at one of these mouths, it is a black hole. No, it's, oh, yeah. well, it's a black hole, but it does have a non-trivial topology. Um, structure. But we cannot see that from a with a telescope, no, from the Earth. Um, I, I'm not sure actually. I I, I don't know if the. <laughs> I mean, Roberto is laughing here, and he knows the answer. And he's letting me struggle. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm not laughing, and I mean, don't know the answer. I have things that I could say, but I let you. Yeah, I have also answer. things that I can say, but I don't think it's more than just speculation. Um, I, I don't think anybody actually looked into this enough to say for sure if the I don't know gravitational waveform is going to be much more different than for the black holes, for example. But. Um, I guess one could only hope. I, I guess the, if you wanted to study, for example, yeah, actually, I'm not sure. I, I don't want to say anything that's not going to be completely correct. But has anyone studied the quasi-normal modes of these uh, wormholes or? Probably, but I don't know. Okay, so for sure, I'm, I'm pretty sure actually that for the model that Maldacena has, that nobody studied this. Um, I don't know if Roberto, you know any reference about this. Well, uh, first of all, this, of course, if, if you want to have a chance of uh, observing them, that's uh, coming back to, they'd better be the, the big ones, right? Yeah. The humanly traversable ones, uh, because the other ones, uh, it would be. Nevertheless, they, they would look like uh, magnetic monopoles from, from the outside. Okay, that's, and well, you would detect them in the way that uh, you might try to detect the uh, magnetic, uh, magnetic monopoles. If they are the humanly traversable ones, well, they are still, uh, they are larger, but astrophysically they are, they are tiny objects. Uh, I mean, it's enough to, to have a human crossing them, but it, they're still uh, very small objects. And in this case, these ones, they wouldn't even look like a magnetic, uh, magnetic monopoles, like big magnetic monopoles, because the charge would be under, uh, 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 this would be charge of a, of a hidden sector. Okay, so it's, uh, it's something that wouldn't show up. I think it's, uh, The charge is in the hidden sector because, yeah, um, the, the electric uh, charge should be in that, uh, that sector. So uh, then, uh, so they, they would look like, like black holes, and then they would be, uh, the, their length should be long. And then whether you could see the other, the other end, uh, I mean, how well you, you would see something, but uh, probably it will be, uh, I don't know. I mean, detection of this of this would be would be difficult. The regarding the, stabi the stability, I think that they can be stable or metastable and long lived, but they are very fragile, nevertheless. Then about the quasi normal modes, uh, most of the quasi normal modes would be like the quasi normal modes of uh, of Rayleigh's nostrum. 
Uh, so in, and they would be uh, they wouldn't be much affected by what's happening down in the in the tube. I think that the well, uh, fluctuations of the tube they will be stable, uh, at least uh, within some range, uh, small range of of so This is not something that anybody computed, right? Well, uh, as I say, uh, I don't think it's been explicitly computed or computed much. Yeah. But uh, the, the the fact that uh, since most of the geometry is like uh, the geometry of a of a near extreme res nostrum solution, yeah, yeah, of course, and yeah. most of the modes are localized uh, far from the far from the from the bottom of the throat. Most of the modes are, are going to look like, like that, and then I think that the small fluctuations around the the, the center of the tube those are uh, uh, must be stable. But they don't, I don't think that they have been computed explicitly. That's right. Well, concerning your uh, comment, uh, Maria, on the emission of gravitational waves, it seems uh, to me very likely that uh, if you have merging of the two wormhole mouths, the effect uh, will be very different uh, if black holes are connected by a wormhole or they are not, because in one case you are destroying a non-trivial topology and that produces uh, presumably uh, cost energy. No? It's, it's an speculation. Nobody knows. Yeah, I mean, it's a. It's a I, I could speak that, that you will have a, a very different effect. Uh, in the case of the black hole, you can calculate it. it is, this is what people of light were doing. But uh, in the case of a wormhole, maybe this has not been calculated and it has a different. Uh, I, I think it would be definitely a good calculation to do. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think it's definitely worth it. I agree. So one one other question, uh, Maria. Um, in, in order to create this uh, wormhole, it seems that you would have to, for example, if you have this magnetic charge, uh, you would have to pair create these, these two mouths somehow, right? But so here it seems to me that, uh, you know, the only way to pair create this, which would presumably have a mass much larger than, than a Planck mass, is to, you know, you have to have twice as much the energy, at least twice the energy of these uh, uh, two mouths of the wormhole. Okay, but this would then be, you know, a, a black hole with twice the mass. Uh, and, and then uh, if, you, if you have to, well, because it has to be in a very small space, so then basically this pair creation, it seems that it would involve a violation of the second law of thermodynamics, right? Because it's like going from a bigger black hole to two smaller black holes. It's like Schwinger effect, uh, Jordi. Is, uh, but in Schwinger effect, you have electric fields and per creation of, say, electron and positron. No? Well, and but here, uh, here you have to... Field, uh, you can create uh, this... Well, but I'm not sure if you can... Uh, um, you can create this, you can do this pair creation, right? But from a large enough volume that, you know, this energy to pair create is not going to be a black hole, basically. <laughs> so that's there my question. Eh? In general relativity, there is a solution called the Ernst solution. Yes. Which precisely describes a, a pair creation of a magnetic Kali charged black holes a, in a uniform magnetic field. Uh -huh. They accelerate each other, separating. So you you wouldn't. Uh, I guess in general you think you can you can do this pair creation uh, and create this wormhole without violating the second law of thermodynamics. Yes. Yeah. Yes. There was also just to comment on the comment. I guess you mentioned that the, the there is a solution where they accelerate away from each other, but. Um, Recently, there was a paper by Horowitz and Merrill et al, where they managed to describe a way in order to make wormholes that would not accelerate. Um, sorry, black holes that are connected, but they would not accelerate away from each other. So that would be actually a traversable wormhole from the start. Well, it would be a non-traversable wormhole, but you can make it traversable, um, but it will be a stable one. So yeah. But why you say, what's your point of the second law, Jordi? I didn't get it. What's your point? Oh, it's just that, uh, I mean, you need to do this pair creation, 
and then you need so you need to have the the energy uh, of this wormhole. But the question is if this if you can make the wormhole with this energy um, in a volume that's big enough uh, so that it doesn't collapse to a black hole, right? So it, it has to be you know. Uh, well, a volume that's bigger, much bigger than the Schwarzschild radius of this energy. Uh, well, in this example that I mentioned, uh, you have a large volume filled by a uniform magnetic field. It's not exactly uniform, but almost uniform. You have like a flux tube, actually. And uh, the black created black holes accelerate from each other. So they, they cannot collapse into black holes because they are, they are getting far uh, but when they're pair created, you need to pair create with these two magnetic charges, right? Yes, yes. How this do you do this? Happens. Well, this is the Schwinger effect. No? Uh, you have a, in the case of the electric field, uh, you, in the vacuum, you have a flat, a vacuum fluctuations with positrons and electrons. Yeah. And the electric field is not uh, strong enough, they separate from each other. Yes, you, I understand how this works for electron positron, but if you have to create two black holes with magnetic charges, which is the only thing you could have magnetic charge if you don't, do not have them in the standard model, then how do you do that? Right? You need to create two black holes somehow with yes, magnetic charges. Then in yeah. order to create this, you need a bigger black hole with twice the energy. So uh, then it means that you're uh, decreasing the horizon area by by having this kind of splitting of a black hole into smaller ones. But you're not splitting the black hole. You're creating two separate black holes out yes. of the vacuum. And yes. they are uh, they are at a sufficient distance from each other that they are not in the Schwarzschild radius of the entire of the entire system. Okay, but, but how is this done? Uh, somehow they are created by quantum fluctuations when they're yes. already far enough. Well, they, are, they have to be far enough, but I mean, not too far. That depends also on the, on the, on the, on the field. But that's uh, when they are separate uh, black holes, you create them at a distance that, as I say, is larger than the, than the total. I mean, it's a distance that's larger than the total Schwarzschild radius of the, of the system. Mm -hmm. but, uh, uh, well, that seems to involve a quantum fluctuation that's much bigger than a Planck mass. It's a, it's a large uh, quantum fluctuation. Yes, that's right. Yeah, and then uh, how about the electric field? You need to create the quantum fluctuation. It has to be, I mean, it, it has to be a magnetic <laughs> field. The magnetic field has to be very large. If you want, to, I mean, this is exponentially suppressed. Okay, like all of yes. these uh, spontaneous nucleation processes. So that you can work out the numbers if you take the largest uh, magnetic fields that we have in the universe, presumably close to a neutron star, and then yes. you can see that uh, well, if you want to wait for one of these things to be per created, well, you just sit and wait. <laughs> I, think, uh, I would see it. Um, right, but uh, it seems like the magnetic energy, you know, B squared over 8 pi would be Planck density, right? To create this oh. thing or much yeah. bigger. So it's going <laughs> so. to be suppressed. Uh, if, so it's going to be suppressed, uh, the, the, the suppression, the exponent in the, in the suppression factor, it's going to be, as you're, I think you're already correctly guessing, it's a square of the uh, ratio between the electroweak scale and the Planck scale. Mm -hmm. That's a huge number. Yes. Oh. Okay. <laughs> I mean, that's a huge suppression. I mean, it's a very small amount. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, more questions? I've got just a short one, actually. So, in how far can I think about the two mouths as, as black holes, or in how far do they behave as black holes if you actually can tra 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 traverse the wormhole? How, how should I think about this? Um, what? I mean, usually you wouldn't expect from a black hole that you can come out of the black hole, no? I mean, the, the, no. I, no. I guess it will be a nice surprise that you survive. <laughs> I mean, if you're so, if the black holes are sufficiently far away, so it's for you to not see the other one, then this just looks like a black hole uh, for all purposes of the outside observer, right? It's only when you actually go inside uh, that you see a difference from an observer's perspective. Of course, if you see them, you know, rotating around each other, you might think, oh, this can look like a, one of these wormholes that I was talking about, but it's the same point. Locally, they look just like black holes, but it's when you traverse them that you realize that you were very lucky. I, I don't know if that's what you were asking, actually, so. 
Yeah, it goes in this direction. I was just wondering, I mean, usually you would expect to, if you think about a black hole, it's completely absorptive, no? It absorbs everything. But if, if you have a wormhole mouth, it can't be completely absorbing, no? This is what I was asking about. Yeah, stuff can go out of it as much as it can go in it. So you're, you're right about that, yes. Um. Yeah, okay, thank you. Other questions? Well, if not, uh, we thank uh, Maria again uh, for this uh, very nice talk and uh, thank you. And thank you all for participating. Thank you for coming. Thank you.